Why is fluorescence a useful tool in finding diseases such as dysplasia and oral cancer? The biochemical, morphologic, and environmental changes that accompany disease processes affect natural fluorophores in the tissue and the absorption and scattering properties of the tissue. The net result is a change in the fluorescence observed. There are four main fluorophores that are excited by blue light in oral mucosa. Flavin adenine dinucleotide, or FAD, is thought to be the major contributor of epithelial fluorescence under blue light excitation. It is a coenzyme involved in the Krebs cycle and is correlated with metabolic activity in cells. When a cell is actively metabolizing, there is a lower concentration of FAD. Therefore, cancer cells, which are generally more active than normal cells, exhibit less FAD fluorescence than normal. The major contributor to stromal fluorescence is collagen and the collagen crosslinks that help maintain the structural integrity of the collagen matrix. Collagen crosslinks fluoresce strongly in the green when excited by blue light, as can be seen in this fluorescence microscope image of collagen. As dysplasia and cancer progress, the collagen matrix starts to break down to make way for the cancer to invade at the basement membrane. This breakdown is associated with decreased numbers of collagen crosslinks and therefore decreased stromal fluorescence. Keratin is a structural protein that fluoresces strongly when excited by blue light. Certain areas of the oral cavity are naturally keratinized squamous epithelium, the attached gingiva, and hard palate. Other oral tissues can become keratinized, hyperkeratosis, and thus show increased fluorescence as a result of chronic irritation or as part of the disease process. Example, leukoplakia. All other things being equal, this keratin layer, if thick enough, can show up quite brightly under velscope. Porphyrin is produced by bacteria and fluoresces quite strongly in the red part of the spectrum when excited by blue light. The presence of bacteria is thus characterized by the presence of a remarkable orange-red color, as can be seen in this image of some bacteria from a tonsillar crypt, giving off an orange glow. Both melanin and blood will increase light absorption in the tissue. Thus, their presence will cause a marked decrease in tissue fluorescence and result in a distinct darker area in the predominantly green oral mucosal tissue fluorescence. This is a graphic representation of the stages of dysplasia, which illustrates some of the main epithelial features of dysplastic progression into invasive cancer. Precancerous epithelial lesions typically start below the surface of the tissue at the basement membrane and grow until they occupy the entire epithelium. The various stages of dysplasia are called mild, moderate, and severe, and are correlated with the proportion of the epithelium taken up by abnormal cells, as shown in this diagram. When the dysplasia takes up the entire epithelium, it's called carcinoma in situ. Once the basement membrane has been fully breached, the lesion is referred to as invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Note that pre-malignant stromal changes such as the breakdown of the collagen matrix are not represented here. This is a graphic representation of how dysplastic cells in the epithelium and the disruption or breakdown of the stromal collagen give rise to a decrease in fluorescence intensity compared to the surrounding tissue when viewed with velscope. Here we see in more detail how dysplasia and oral cancer result in decreased fluorescence intensity. There are four processes at work. The increased metabolic activity of the dysplastic cells in the epithelium causes a decrease in FAD, resulting in decreased fluorescence. The breakdown of the collagen matrix, which occurs as a prelude to tumor invasion, results in decreased numbers of collagen crosslinks and thus decreases fluorescence. Increased scattering in the epithelial layer due to morphologic changes that take place in the dysplastic cell nuclei. The effect will be to increase the backscattering of excitation light, which will decrease its intensity in the tissue and result in decreased fluorescence as seen by the naked eye. Increased blood supply needed to support the increased cellular activity of the dysplastic cells in the epithelium will result in additional microvascularization in the stroma and thus increase the absorption of light by blood. This in turn results in a decreased fluorescence as seen by the naked eye. The end result is an irregular dark area that stands out against the otherwise normal green fluorescence pattern of surrounding healthy tissue.
Now, let's take a look at what a normal, healthy mouth typically looks like in some more detail. Generally speaking, healthy oral mucosa presents as a bright green color due to a combination of predominantly green fluorescence from both the epithelial and stromal layers. Here we see the hard palate, which shows, generally speaking, as a broad expanse of green. The soft palate is also generally green. The darker areas around the borders of the image are from shadowing due to the way the blue light has been directed at the tissue. Here we see the buccal mucosa with the highly fluorescing teeth on the right of the picture. However, with fluorescence visualization, different oral structures have their own particular appearance or fluorescence pattern, just as they have their own unique appearance under white light. Here we see healthy tissue that is a generally homogeneous pattern of bright and dark areas. The dark spots are the fungiform papilla that appear dark because of blood perfusion. And the smaller bright spots are the filiform papilla. These have keratinized tips which fluoresce brightly under velscope. So here we are seeing examples of some of the underlying concepts that were explained earlier. Blood is a strong absorber and causes the perceived fluorescence to decrease and keratin fluoresces strongly, which causes the perceived fluorescence to increase. Here we see a Velsco picture of the floor of the mouth and the corresponding area under white light illumination. The ventral surface of the tongue is also partially visible at the back. Again, we see the theme being played out here of blood's role as a strong absorber in fluorescence visualization. The area around the submandibular gland ducts can be well vascularized and is particularly so in this example showing up as a symmetrically dark area under Velscope. Although the symmetry and shape of this dark area under Velscope is suggestive of normal tissue, the floor of the mouth is a high-risk area for dysplasia. Watch out for non-symmetrical areas giving a unilateral presentation. These should increase suspicion of dysplasia or oral cancer. Here we see the blood vessels on the ventral surface of the tongue, which appear as dark lines under Velscope again due to blood absorption. On the lower portion of the tongue, notice the white reflections from the highly fluorescing teeth. Watch out for this. In some situations, it may be confusing. This is an image of the labial mucosa on the upper lip, the blood vessels again showing up dark under Velscope. The labial mucosa this time on the lower lip, presenting similarly as the upper lip. Some oral mucosa appear homogeneously dark under Velscope due to their structural characteristics. A good example is the attached gingiva, which, while having a typically light pink appearance in white light, appear dark under Velscope. The unattached gingiva immediately adjacent to the attached gingiva have a brighter appearance more typical of other mucosal tissues. This makes the mucogingival junction readily apparent under Velscope. The theme of symmetry and bilateral presentation is again evident here. This principle is one of the keys to helping us decide what belongs and what doesn't. The anterior tonsillar pillar typically shows up as dark under Velscope. As we can see from its appearance under white light, the anterior tonsillar pillar is naturally well vascularized. After what we've seen so far, it shouldn't be too surprising that it appears dark under Velscope. Some structures in the mouth have quite a remarkable appearance under Velscope. A good example is the palatine tonsil, the areas of dense vascularization and inflammatory cells appearing quite dark. Again, evident in these pictures is the anterior tonsillar pillar. The minor salivary gland openings on the hard palate can sometimes appear as dark spots when using Velscope. Here we see two examples of the orange-red color from the porphyrin fluorescence generated by bacteria. The tongue is the area in the mouth where this is most commonly observed, as it is quite common for bacteria to get trapped amongst the carpet of filiform papilla or in the fissures that can sometimes develop as can be seen in the lower photograph. Earlier, we saw that the attached gingiva typically appear dark under Velscope, although they naturally appear pale pink under white light. Here is another reason that they can appear dark under Velscope, but in this case, it is for the same reason that they appear dark under white light, the absorption of light by melanin.